before we try to explain how life began, we need to understand what life is. Above is a list of 10 things that life must be able to perform. How life began is a long-standing open question which was asked in Darwin's days and is asked still today. Science has not been able to come up with satisfying answers despite of over half a century of intensive research. George Whiteside, distinguished Harvard chemist. Most chemists believe, as I do, that life emerged spontaneously from mixtures of molecules in the prebiotic earth. How? I have no idea. That life on earth was initiated from abiotic beginnings about 4 billion years ago is a fundamental but unproven assumption. That assumption forms the basis of the modern view which took shape in the 1920s through the joint contributions of the Russian biochemist Alexander Oparin and the influential British geneticist and evolutionary biologist G.B.S. Haldane. Most explanations suggest that the first forms of life were the outcome of a complex mixture of organic compounds of abiotic origin. The miller urey experiment and the RNA hypothesis were landmark contributions to the quest of how life emerged. But the fact is, however, that while in the last 60 years or so enormous scientific advances have been made, in the same time period the total lack of any kind of experimental evidence leading to the recreation of life, not to mention the spontaneous emergence of life, can be regarded as the most humiliating embarrassment of the proponents of naturalism and the whole so-called scientific establishment around it, because it undermines the worldview of who wants naturalism to be true. Many have not lost hope and say, science does not yet know, but one day it will find out. Is that not a classical gap argument, a naturalism of the gaps? How can proponents of spontaneous origin of life be so sure that one day the black box will be opened and science will find a materialistic explanation? Could it be we know enough that there is enough scientific evidence after more than half a century of research to infer with high certainty that an unguided random freaky accident is too unlikely and so impossible? Danton wrote in Evolution Theory in Crisis, we now know not only of the existence of a break between the living and non-living world, but also that it represents the most dramatic and fundamental of all the discontinuities of nature. Between a living cell and the most highly ordered non-biological systems, such as a crystal or a snowflake, there is a chasm of as vast and absolute as it is possible to conceive. To grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometers in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of the cell, we would see millions of openings, like the portholes of a vast spaceship, opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If we were to enter one of these openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. Veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery, made up altogether of 100,000 million atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. Very few leading scientists in the field have the courage to openly admit that the origins of life problem cannot be solved as Stephen Banner. No scientific experiment has been able to come even close to synthesize and reproduce a self-replicating cell in the laboratory through self-assembly and autonomous organization. In 2009, a headline in the news made the round. 
Life's First Spark Recreated in the Laboratory, News Magazine Wired reported. What Craig Gwenter did was copying an existing bacterial genome and transplanted it into another cell, resulting in a genome of a minimal cell looking different than anything in nature. Claiming that this experiment was recreating life in a laboratory was evidently a far stretch and nothing of the sort. Truth is, most people have not the slightest grasp of the enormous challenge to create life from scratch. Origin of life experiments are all performed in a controlled laboratory environment, with purified ingredients concentrated at one spot, all done by intelligence. All this was not extant on early Earth. In a scientific article published in Nature magazine, John Sutherland wrote, Chemical evolution proposals envision a transition of a system from the inanimate state to the animate, as an increase in aliveness over time, by a series of steps rather than a single step. Now, that's rather funny. It is as to ask a woman, are you pregnant? And she, I am in a phase of increase of non-pregnancy to pregnancy. So, if a stepwise gradual emergence of life as portrayed above results in unbreachable problems, why is it proposed nonetheless? Natural events have not the power to create the enormous complexity of the supposed simplest living cell in one big leap. But the materialistic framework upon which modern science rests cannot permit supernatural explanations, with the excuse that the action of a creative agency cannot be tested, and so the explanation is unscientific. But remarkably, lucid scientists like Dr. Wilhelm Hock have openly admitted that the working cell is more than the sum of its parts. A functioning cell must be entirely correct at once in all its complexity. In Scientific American wrote, some of the greatest innovations in existence emerged, the cell, the genetic code, and the energy system to fool it all. All three of these are essential to life as we know it, yet scientists know disappointingly little about how any of these remarkable biological innovations came about. By saying that all three are essential, the authors confirm that the three are not reducible, that is, without any of them, life could not exist. That is the very concept of irreducible complexity. DNA is transcribed to RNA, which is translated to proteins. But proteins are required to make DNA and RNA. This creates an endless loop, which is only solved when we posit that all three emerged at the same time. This problem was recognized already back in 1965, when the author wrote, how, when no life existed, did substances come into being which today are absolutely essential to living systems, yet which can only be formed by those systems? Incredibly complex genetic information, the instructional blueprint of life, is useless without some kind of incredibly complex translation and transcription machinery. And if there is no mechanism of replication and copying machinery of DNA, life would and could not replicate and perpetuate. So in order to solve that chicken and egg, Catch-22 problem, it was proposed that the so-called RNA world would solve that riddle. So in the early 80s, research groups found that RNAs can also act as catalysts for chemical reactions and as such basically perform the duties of proteins. This class of catalytic RNAs are known as ribozymes. RNASP is amongst the most ancient of enzymes, a living molecular fossil from the RNA world, in which life is thought to have originated. According to the RNA world hypothesis, life later evolved to use DNA and proteins due to RNA's relative instability and poorer catalytic properties, and gradually ribozymes became increasingly phased out. In order for that hypothesis to be true, somehow nature would have had to come up with ribozymes without evolution. In regards of the origin of life, pointing to evolution as a possible mechanism is an error of category. 
There was no evolution prior when life began, since evolution depends on the replication of DNA. The only alternative, if God is excluded, is an orderly aggregation and sequentially correct manner of the basic building blocks of life without external direction. In other words, pure luck. Chance giving order to chaos. So let's take RNA ribonuclease and calculate the odds for such an RNA protein to emerge by unguided events on the early Earth. RNASP is a ribozyme, an enzyme with an active site that is composed of RNA and it is present in every living organism. It has 124 amino acids and to get the right sequence by unguided lucky events, it would take 2.2 to the 231th power of trials until getting the right sequence. The number of atoms in the universe is estimated to be 10 to the 80th power. So even to get the simplest ribozyme is in the realm of the utterly impossible. By doing this calculation, we don't even take into consideration the enormous challenge to bond even one amino acid to another to form a ribozyme without the aid of the sophisticated enzymatic machinery in the cell, which evidently was not extant before cells were fully operational. So let's ask another question. What might be a cell's minimal requirement of parts? Mycoplasmas are the simplest known organisms with the smallest known genome to date. No man-made program comes close to the technical brilliance of even mycoplasma genetic algorithms. Mycoplasma genitalium has been used as a prime model for minimal genomes. It is a human urogenital pathogen which has the smallest genome of a size of 580,000 bytes and it consists of only 482 protein coding genes. Based on over 900 scientific publications, the authors of the paper, a whole cell computational model predicts phenotype from genotype, modeled the minimal organism in terms of its molecular components. They came up with 28 processes which are absolutely essential to keep the basic functions of a living cell. That means if any of these processes is missing, life would not exist as we know it. This is the very concept of irreducible complexity, elucidated by a peer-reviewed science paper and not a proponent of intelligent design. And this paper, a minimal estimate for a gene content of the last universal common ancestor, investigated the minimal number of proteins required in a minimal cell. In the abstract of the paper, they elucidate that their aim was to reconstruct the gene content of the last universal common ancestor, a hypothetical life form that presumably was the progenitor of the three domains of life. 561 functional annotation de description means that 561 proteins constitute the minimal number of proteins to keep the basic functions of life. Proteins are essential building blocks of living cells. Indeed, life can be viewed as a resulting substantially from the chemical activity of proteins. Because of their importance, it is hardly surprising that ancestors for most proteins observed today are already present at the time of the last common ancestor, a primordial organism from which supposedly all life on Earth descended. We have listed above 13 essential irreducible cellular processes, which are absolutely indispensable, requiring, as shown above, at least 561 proteins. Now we can ask, what are the odds to get a complete proteome of these proteins by unguided, random lucky events, by a freaky accident, if design did play no relevance to get life a first go? So the odds based on the calculation above to get the functional minimal proteome for a minimal cell would be 1 in 10 to the power of 378,000. To arrive at a statistical proof, we need a reasonable criterion to judge it by. As just a starting point, consider that many statisticians consider that any occurrence with a chance of happening that is less than one chance out of 10 of the 50th power is an occurrence with such a slim probability that is, in general, statistically considered to be zero. Borel's law holds that events 
that require more than 10 to the 50th power of trial and errors to get one successful can be considered impossible. 10 to the 50th power is a number of one with 50 zeros after it, and it's spoken 10 to the 50th power. The appraisal seems fairly reasonable when you consider that 10 to the 50th power is about the number of atoms which make up the planet Earth. So overcoming one chance out of 10 to the 50th power is like marking one specific atom out of the Earth and mixing it in complete, completely and then someone makes one blind random selection which turns out to be that specifically marked atom. Most mathematicians and scientists have accepted this statistical standard for many purposes. Obviously, 10 to the 378,000th power is a gigantic number far above any realistic probability to occur by unguided events. Even a trillion universes, each hosting a trillion planets and each shuffling a trillion times in a trillionth of a second, continuously for a trillion years, would not be enough. Such astronomically unimaginably gigantic odds are in the realm of the utmost extremely impossible. But up to now, we analyzed the odds just to get a functional proteome. But the problem doesn't stop here. A cell must be able to produce all basic building blocks of life, amino acids, fatty acids, nucleotides and sugars. These building blocks of life are essential to make carbohydrates, nucleic acids, proteins and lipids. All of these are essential and none were successfully synthesized in the laboratory. So life does not depend solely on a minimal proteome, but as well a minimal genome, transcriptome and metabolome. All of this had to emerge by unguided random lucky events if design is excluded. Evolution was not there to help. And Paul Davis said, Acknowledging the interdependability of the component molecules within a living organism immediately presents us with a stark philosophical puzzle. If everything needs everything else, how did the community of molecular ever arise in the first place? As most large molecules needed for life are produced only by living organisms and are not found outside the cell, how did they come to exist originally without the help of a medding scientist? Could we seriously expect a Miller-Rodé type of soap to make them all at once, given the hit and miss nature of its chemistry?